Hi everyone, my name is Amanda Simmons and I'm a team member of the clinical team at Skills in the Hill Pediatric Therapy in Washington, DC. We are happy to present our presentation on buffering burnout, which is a conversation about how to stay co-regulated, connected, and engaged with your child, especially during these crazy times. In the contents of this presentation, we will have an overview of common concerns and stressors when parenting a child with special needs. Will you go through evidence-based principles of co-regulation and attachment theory, strategies, interventions, and effective methods for strengthening connection, resources, and then questions at the end. The top four stressors for parents that are parenting a child with Angelman syndrome are behavior, um, inappropriate or socially unacceptable behaviors. It's really um, stressful for the parent, and that includes a child's hyperactivity or distractibility. Two, sleep challenges. Children with Angelman syndrome have sleep disturbances and sometimes have sleep onset insomnia, as well as sleep maintenance issues and low melatonin during their circadian rhythm. So poor sleep means kind of a challenging morning for both parent and child. Um, lack of adaptability, so the inability to adapt to small routine changes, um, which gives you kind of a sense of unpredictability. When is, a challenge, when is there going to be a challenge for one of our transitions? Um, kind of keeping the parent and the child on edge. And four, reinforcement inability to positively reinforce the parent. This is important because in neurotypical children, a parent will present a behavior and the child will appropriately react to the behavior, perpetuating the cycle of connection. You know, the thing happens, the child responds to it and the parent and child are on the same page. But a child with Angelman is less able to positively reinforce the parent in the sense that they're less able to accurately and validly tell the parent that what the parent is doing is helpful um, due to the communication deficits. So this leads to caregivers feeling less capable, which leads to caregiver burnout. Co-regulation is the ability for people to regulate their body, feelings, and emotions and arousal in tandem with another person or an attachment figure. Um, some children have better regulation skills than others. All children are born worthy of love and affection, but no child is born learning how to auto-regulate. The initial idea was that children came to us perfect, that they were born and, you know, everything that parents did was impacting the way that they communicate or the way that they feel or the way that they regulate their emotions, but we know that that is not true. And that now, um, the research kind of suggests that it's a mix of a lot of things, womb experiences, true disposition, neurobiology, um, and learning style. Some children are just less able to pick up the subtle cues from the parent or nonverbal expressions from the parent, which kind of makes emotional regulation, especially when we learn from our parents and we learn from those parent models. If we can't pick those cues up, it's a lot harder for us to kind of learn those skills. Um, consistency is always helpful, but even a perfect parent, you know, could have a child that is not a great autoregulator or a child that needs more help in this area. Um, we co-regulate with everyone around us, but for the most part, we co-regulate with our closest um, attachment figure. So adults, even when they go home to their parents, will sometimes co-regulate with their parents and children will co-regulate with the person that is closest to them. Um, and when that adult is in the stress cycle, the interbrain connection will will cause the child to also have stress. The child's frontal lobe is not fully developed, at least until you're 25. And so when the adult is in the stress cycle, the child will take the information from that adult's frontal lobe and then also be in that stress cycle. Um, but when the interbrain connection is calm and regulated, stress behaviors are reduced. So this is taken from John Gottman's blog, Raising Exceptional Families with Special Needs Children. Um, and it's a great blog to kind of look at if you have the time. This is one of my favorite quotes from Brene Brown. We cannot give our children what we don't have. If we want them to love and accept who they are, our job is to love and accept who we are. I think it's one of the most beautiful quotes um, and it really applies to some of the stuff. The way that attachment works is basically the infant seeks out the person in their world that they are getting their self-worth from. So they'll look up at their attachment figure and they're looking for that 
adults to maintain some type of affect stability, which means, you know, even if that affect is neutral and maybe not super positive, they're looking for that stability. Um, when that reciprocal interaction happens, when the infant is getting what they seek, um, it has a high reward value. So there's probably a little bit of dopamine, o oxytocin. Um, the infant is getting that interaction and they're getting that high reward. And so what they're going to continue to do is work toward that reward using strategies developed in previous interactions with the caregiver. So um, this is a way that children get what's called attention. And in, that can be a positive way and that can be in a negative way. Um, healthy attachment, we know from the research, is the fundamental means for establishing positive emotional states and is required for healthy neurodevelopment. Um, co-regulation, you know, effective co-regulation creates a buffer for the child and it makes otherwise toxic stress tolerable. So something that might be noxious to them, even if it's a small thing or we think it's a small thing, if we have good co-regulation, they will have a, a buffer for their world. Um, and that's a really, really important finding. Parent-child interactions impact self-regulation. We all want our children to be self-regulated, especially when we're out in public or especially when they're at school. Um, you know, these things might seem obvious, what's on this slide. It might seem obvious that if a child enjoys your company, they are more likely to comply with the things you teach them. Um, but there are some parent structures out there that believe fear or coercion are the best motivators for a child's behavior, and the research simply does not support that. The research supports that more positive, stable, comfortable interactions are where the child is going to learn best and maintain those skills over time. It is always important to maintain a calm and collected approach in order to produce better functional outcomes, regardless of who the child is. Brene Brown also does talk about in one of her books, she talks about how we often, when a child comes into the room, we are really quick to give them a correction. So they'll come into the room and we'll say, oh, your shirt is untucked, or oh, you have something on your face, or oh, your shoes are on backwards. Um, and she says, it's really, really important to try your best when your child walks into the room to always smile and greet them first so that they know that you're invested in them and that you want the best for them. Um, and then it's just something to kind of keep in mind. It's something I keep in mind as a therapist that when I see my children for the first time, even if they are having a meltdown, I will appear happy to see them. And that is really, really fundamental. And it's an easy thing that we can integrate into our lives at all times. Co-regulation is going to be different in the presence of developmental delays. The reason of this is that caregivers with, of children that have developmental disabilities report more psychological distress because they have more on their plate. There's greater variability in socially acceptable behaviors, there's lower levels of positive engagement, there's more frustration. Caregivers of children with disabilities report higher rates of depression, anxiety, and stress than the average adult. So it's already challenging for adults to be well-regulated, and then it is consequently challenging for the co-regulation piece to tie in. Um, so it is going to be different for any parent that's, that's parenting a child with a significant disability or a significant delay. Um, and so it's important to keep that in mind and give yourself grace because these things aren't going to always be perfect. It's, it's not going to be 100% of the time and sometimes it's going to be 50% of the time and you're just giving the best that you got. And it's really important to keep in mind. Here are the steps to co-regulating with a child. One, name it. Labeling emotions accurately greatly improves the chances that we will then let that emotion flow. Emotions really only stick with us for about 10 seconds. It's the story we tell ourselves about that emotion that makes it stick longer. So if we can accurately recognize and name what you are feeling, you know, is it anger? Is it frustration? Is it fear? Um, we can then move past or move through this emotion. We, as a society, completely undervalue the idea of naming our emotions and we overestimate our emotional vocabulary. Even um, the smartest, brightest adults don't have a very good or very broad emotional vocabulary. And it's something that we need to continually work to develop. Evaluate yourself. Do you have the emotional bandwidth to calm your child? Similar to how you would frame yourself in an airplane, if the mask drops down, you put the mask on yourself first and then you put the mask on the child. 
there are situations where you will not have the opportunity to hit this step if your child is in danger, um, if your child is going to endanger someone else, you don't have the time to evaluate if you can calm your child effectively. But in most cases, even if your child is having a full meltdown at the grocery store, try your best to calm yourself in whatever way that you can first. The rest of the people in the grocery store don't matter. It's going to be okay. They're going to be fine. You want to kind of demonstrate to your child that you can consistently keep yourself in a regulated state even when they're becoming dysregulated. The next step is experiment and becoming a feeling scientist. This requires some higher verbal skills, but you can still participate in this step even if your child has communication deficits or intellectual deficits or things, you know, maybe complex language is too hard for them. You can still say, um, things that they can reasonably understand. So for example, instead of saying, don't feel that, or don't be sad, or you don't need to be sad about that, you can say, tell me more, or why is that? Even if it's something as small as like they wanted the red plate and they got the blue plate, like it doesn't matter. Tell me more about that, tell me more. Um, and you can kind of use this as best you can. If your child is unable to verbally communicate at all, you can, experiment for them and just label the emotion for them. What you think that they might be feeling and participate with them as if they are feeling that feeling. Then you're going to regulate together. We, you know, therapists, parents, everyone, you know, kind of did this regulation thing where if a kid was really, really highly elevated, we would just go lower. Like everyone's had the experience of being in a classroom, teachers like, oh wait, um, or, or they're really quiet and they start to lower their voice and sometimes the class will lower their voice with them. And sometimes that works, but for a very, very dysregulated child, it is better to start high with them, get their attention, be at the, the place that they're at and teach them how to come down together. So if they're very, very distracted or they're very, very hyper, maybe engage them in that like higher arousal, higher level voice, and then bring it down with them so that they can learn to come from a high state to a low state. Um, this is something that we learned in one of our trauma courses and I think it's a really really effective way I've used it with a lot of kids um, and you can kind of use that as a way to gauge how to get them from one place to another and then number five is apologize an apology from an authority figure goes a very long way and if we want children to hold themselves accountable for their decisions we also want to hold ourselves accountable for those same decisions um, we are not without flaw and it's important to kind of remember that and children often feel very surprised when they get an apology from an adult. Here are some more co-regulation steps. One, provide a warm reciprocal relationship. Um, recognize, respond to cues. Um, try to be really, really in touch with your child and try to pay attention, which is kind of the most important part. Two, structure the environment. Structure it to be successful. If you want to have a smooth transition during the day, maybe have a visual schedule ready in the morning. Maybe have your activity for the morning set up ahead of time. Structure the environment to what your child needs. It is not a failure of parenting if your child cannot do something that is expected of them. You can tailor the environment to kind of meet them where they're at. Um, you wanna provide a reasonable buffer against stress if there is something that they can typically do, such as pull up their pants, and one day they're just like, can't pull up their pants or um, their skills that you know that they can manage, it's okay to let them continue to work on those skills and to kind of grade those skills so that you can help them get through whatever the task is. Um, but it's not expected that they can do something that they've never done before. So continue to structure the environment so that they can be successful and have well-defined consequences that are logical in the event that that doesn't go well. And then teach the co-regulation skills. We kind of talked about this earlier, but teach them how to come down with you so that they can use the skill in the future. This is a caregiver self-reflection and self-regulation. Um, how are your self-regulation skills? So when you're interacting with your child, kind of recognize the following. Label your feelings during these interactions and try to find patterns. Evaluate your beliefs about the behaviors of others. Do we think that the child is automatically trying to be manipulative when they cry? What does it mean to cry for attention? What does it mean to want attention? We all want attention. I want attention. Everyone wants attention. Um, it's just about getting that in, in a way that makes sense and that in a way is functional and 
sustainable for the entire family. Um, use self calming strategies to communicate effectively and compassionately when you are a little bit regulated. So, or dysregulated. So just pause and reflect. This is something that you can use prior to kind of engaging your child in a problem solving or solution oriented approach. These are some calming sensory regulation strategies. So in our clinic, when a child comes to us and they're very, very dysregulated, um, we will use some of these strategies to kind of calm their arousal. So these are for your hyperactive kiddos that are maybe moving from place to place. They can't calm down, they can't settle. Um, low and ambient lighting. Um, I like Christmas lights. Those are kind of my favorite ambient lighting. I think they provide a really warm environment. Foods with lots of sensory affordances. So sensory affordance means a food that has a lot of different components that can tap into your child's unique sensory needs. Um, crunchy foods are really great. Very salty foods are also very great. Sour foods are also very great. Um, but crunchy seems to be the one that works the best for most children. And it's also something tolerable and usually like something like goldfish are really, really easy to eat. Um, common and repetitive visual stimuli. So you can think of that as like bubbles, um, a lava lamp, something that's repetitive that that keeps going and going and going that you can put on a loop and that's not going to either surprise the child. Um, warm, heavy blankets. The weighted blanket movement was like last year, everyone loved weighted blankets. I still believe in them. You can even get heated blankets now. So that would be a really good option. Music at 60 beats per minute is the beat of your heartbeat. It's thought to kind of tap into kind of those more primal feelings of security. And so music at 60 beats per minute is also a common strategy that we've used. Um, meditation music with a heavy drum or bass. Heavy drums and basses have been used in Eastern medicine for a long time, so it's something that we want to also consider going forward. Some of the co-regulation strategies continued. Scaffold the regulation experience using various prompts. What happened? How are you feeling? How do you want to feel? Um, if your child doesn't have the verbal ability, you can say, you seem frustrated. We can feel happy by um, problem solving. Um, why don't you let him play with your toy and I'll make sure he gives it back in two minutes. And with that problem solving, using visuals, so using a visual timer, using a visual schedule, using a first then board to support your child. Because if we use more sensory experiences to kind of help them transition and help them get through these challenging situations, um, that will be really beneficial for them. You want to pair the verbal prompt with the visual prompt as much as you possibly can. Um, turn towards your child's bids for affection instead of away from them. So when your child is acting up, when they're really distractible, when they're really sad, when they're really angry, instead of turning away from them um, and saying, no, no, like, I don't want to deal with that. Or like you're on, you know, maybe being on your phone, we're all guilty of, or maybe being on the laptop, try to turn toward your child's bids for affection. That being said, ignoring a behavior so that it decreases is a very real behavioral management strategy and it does need to be employed sometimes. But in a genuine bid for affection, which is a bid for connection, try your very best to turn towards your child and make your expectations clear. If you just don't have it in you, so say you're not regulated and you can't get regulated, you can say, mommy needs 10 minutes, I will be back to check on you or daddy needs 10 minutes and I'll be back to check on you. Here's a timer. And if they get upset, they get upset. It's time for you to take a step back and make sure that you are in a good space before you can engage them in a self-regulation strategy, unless they are in danger or they're dangering someone else. And then consider your own specific triggers and your reactions to those triggers. So does a messy room set you off? Does a child screeching set you off? Um, and what do you do when you get triggered by the things that your child does? Are you screaming? Are you taking things away? Are you threatening? Are you giving them the silent treatment? Are you guilting, bribing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Just evaluate what your triggers are and then how you respond to them. And then think about different ways that you could respond differently to promote better connection and co-regulation. These are some emotional regulation strategies. So these are really helpful for you in the moment. You can use them with your children, but these are more adult oriented strategies and um, maybe older children. Mindful breathing, um, we respond to stress by activating the sympathetic nervous system. And so we flood our systems with cortisol and mindful breathing helps us basically put the brakes on that cortisol flood. 
we want to decrease our heart rate. So you can take some time to pause. You can use the Headspace or Calm app. You can practice small, work your way up. Um, there's a billion different ways to kind of do some mindful breathing. So one of them is four, seven, eight breathing. You hold in for four seconds, breathe in for four seconds, hold for seven seconds, and then breathe out for eight seconds. Another method that I've seen people use is you breathe in twice, one breath on top of the other, and then you exhale for three seconds. So you'll be like, and let a big exhale. Forward looking strategies are recognizing your triggers and preemptively working to problem solve them and help your child do the same. If you know something's gonna happen, set up the environment so that it doesn't happen or it happens in a way that you can manage it better. Maybe introduce them to that small stressor, but don't introduce it to the full extent. Um, attention shifting strategies. This is my favorite for small children or children that have really, really low verbal capabilities. This is basically looking away from the stressful encounter, getting away from it, distracting with a familiar activity. Um, this is really good for kids that are in complete meltdown and you can't really get them back once they're, you know, they're in that space where they're just too far away, you can't get them back. Um, it's time to pull some of those sensory tools, like those repetitive stimuli, the warm blankets, the comforting tools. Balloon games are really great because the balloon is very, it floats, it's very ethereal. Um, that's another way to kind of engage them. It's okay to engage them in a sensory strategy when they're doing a behavior you don't like. You're not reinforcing that behavior. It's very unlikely that they're going to continue to do this very, very, you know, overly wild behavior in order to get bubbles. Um, if you find that that is happening, then we can change up the approach. But for the most part, when they're in full meltdown, like a true sensory meltdown, go ahead and use the sensory strategies to kind of help them regulate. And then you can kind of talk about why that's not okay. And you can even present at the end of that, a logical consequence. Wow, I really don't like that you threw your toy against the wall. It doesn't seem like this toy can be used right now. Let's think of something else we can do. Um, and then cognitive reframing strategies. These are kind of more an, of an adult strategy, but consciously choosing to be the situation that has the least negative emotion in us that can give us the least negative emotion. Um, this is pulled from a book called Permission to Feel by Mark Brackett. I recommend that all adults read it. Um, and if you have any children that are kind of in their teen years, this is a really good book to kind of guide them through um, kind of understanding their feelings. This is a family regulation strategy. I took this from Brene Brown. Um, this is called the family gap plan. And so this is something you can do with your family or, or your spouse or whoever you are living with. Um, opening the conversation to your family. Like we can't always bring 100% to the table, but we need 100% to get through the day. So on ideal days, maybe you and your partner, you and your parent, whoever you're co-regulating with can give 50-50 or 60-40, but sometimes there isn't. Sometimes you can only both give 20 and then you've got like a 60% deficit to make up. Um, so you can make a set of family rules and post them visually when there's when there is that really big deficit. So for Brene Brown, she has a set of family rules and hers are no harsh words or faces to, to yourself or to anyone else. Um, apologize when you need to. Respond to apologies with thank you instead of okay. Um, and then be silly when you have to. And then some of her strategies that she knows is a family that are going to work for that family is to get enough sleep, move your body eat a vegetable, and limit your technology. Mindful parenting is um, kind of a new area of study. It's important because it suggests that parents that engage in mindfulness practices often have improved physiological states and improved physiological states reduces oxidative stress. And if we have reduced oxidative stress, this means that we can increase our capacity for kindness and empathy, meaning that we can then respond to someone else in a more appropriate way. Regardless of the developmental stage of the child, parent dispositional mindfulness equated to mindful parenting. It doesn't matter um, what disability that child has or what level they're at. Um, this had better outcomes than control groups. And um, the mindfulness skills of describing something non-judgmentally and observing the environment or observing what's happening as a, as a non-judgmental, non-biased um, third party, as well as problem-focused coping, is protective against burnout. The research suggests that if we can give less weight to the things that are happening and we can just observe them, that we will be better off and we won't burn out so quickly. Relational compassion is expressed as the parent's skillful 
responses towards the child. So the child has a, a behavior and the parents skillfully response to them instead of reacting out of like gut or instinct. Um, especially during these times where the child might be in distress, shame, guilt, um, self-criticism. We wanna to try to limit those things in our children by skillfully responding to them instead of um, kind of instinctively or reflexively responding to them. And then self-compassion is a really, really big one. So um, in this model, they conceptualize self-compassion as turning towards suffering with an attitude of kindness, compassion, and acceptance in a way that we might direct care and tenderness towards a friend. How would you respond to your friend if, you were, if they were going through a challenging situation? That's how you want to try to respond to yourself. Um, there are formal self-compassion meditations. Kristen Pearson Neff has them on her website, and I think they can be really helpful. Um, but it's really just giving yourself the grace to make the mistakes when you make them and to act towards yourself like you would act towards someone else because we often are our biggest critic. And that rubs off on our children. Here are some ways to support your child at home um, integrating into your routines. So there's something called formal mindfulness, which is like meditation, yoga, like you sit down to meditate, you sit down to do yoga, you're doing some mindful movement, you're balancing your chakras, whatever it is. That's more of a formal mindfulness approach. Informal mindfulness is being present and curious in almost everything that you do. So taking daily routine tasks and then focusing really, really closely on that moment. Um, and you can do this with anything. You can do this when you're driving, you can do this when you're brushing your teeth, you can do this when you're eating. Um, so for example, mindful eating is understanding all the properties of the food. So instead of eating as quickly as you can or eating just to get the nutrients in, you're eating and you're saying, this food is salty, this food tastes different from when I put it in my mouth to when I swallowed it, it now tastes different. I can move the food from place to place. Um, or playful eating really like, when I was little, I used to put olives on my fingers. I did it the other day in front of my, my friends and they were like, that's really weird. But kind of engaging in something in a different way than you're used to engaging it and being mindful of the properties of, of that thing um, is a way to kind of in, bring in that, that mindfulness piece. Um, mindful awareness is the awareness and ability to explore a space in a new way or to explore a new space. So a lot of the times, like you can ask your child, what's one thing you notice different about this room? Is there anything different than normal? Um, and it might be just like an envelope on the table or something really simple, but being aware of your space, your surroundings, what you're hearing, what you're feeling, what temperature you're at, that's just calming mindful awareness. And then mindful communication. So being aware of when you are able to communicate in a thoughtful way um, and understanding that when you're distracted or trying to multitask, it's not the greatest way to communicate if you're only giving half of yourself. So mindful communication is also really important, something you can easily integrate into your routine. These are just an overview of um, the professional journals that some of this information is coming from, and at the end, um, books and parenting resources. So parenting resources are really important. There are a lot of groups, and one of the most protective things against caregiver burnout is building a community around what you're feeling and experiencing because the biggest thing especially during the covid pandemic that a lot of caregivers are starting to feel is isolation and you're not alone in these experiences and you can kind of connect with other parents even if you know enough the other child doesn't have angel man or maybe the other child doesn't have the same um exact disability the feelings of loneliness isolation embarrassment fear um worry and frustration, those are universal feelings. And so building a community, getting involved in that community can be a really, really helpful piece to kind of buffer the burnout with you and your child. These are just some other books and parenting resources that I've used um, to kind of compile some of the information for this presentation. Um, and now we have some time for questions. So go ahead and um, when I give this presentation live, we'll be able to give some questions now, but um, for this, this is kind of the conclusion of the presentation. And um, if you have any questions or concerns, you can email me at um, my skills on the hill email address. Thanks guys.